Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. What's the role of the humble pig in the regenerative ag movement and why is building brands key to get customers on board? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to another episode today with John, who is with his family and a network of pork producers are attempting to usher the humble pig into the world of regenerative agriculture. Welcome, John. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I know you have a long history, a family history into farming, but that doesn't mean you had to end up on a farm. So how, how did you end up working on regenerative agriculture on soil? And then we talk about the pig part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did we end up farming? We ended up farming because I truly and deeply love having a relationship with the earth, being able to touch the earth for a living. And there are so many stories in the world. There are so many stories about how human beings create the downward spiral of destruction. Anytime they touch a resource for economic gain, they ruin it. And I feel somewhat disturbed by that being the only narrative. I would like to demonstrate through regenerative agriculture that the opposite is very possible. We can touch the earth for a living. We can provide for our families and create economic gain for ourselves and build soil and healthy food. And at the same time, we can be healing ecosystems. And that's really what gets me up in the morning. That's what puts a little sparkle in my eye, is thinking human beings can touch the earth and we can provide for ourselves and we can create a more robust and more ro uh, vibrant uh, ecosystem than the one that we receive. And what do you tell the naysayers? Because that's a pretty big statement is the reason I'm interested in the space, but it's a pretty big statement you put there that we are able to economically regenerate, provide, and actually heal a lot of places and ecosystems. And then you get like, yeah, but what about feeding the world? And what about, and so what, what, how do you normally start a conversation like that? If somebody goes into the, the defense mood and crosses his arms or her arms, and what would you advise people? Because I think a lot of people in listening to this could help some pointers to have that kind of discussion with a lot of naysayers we often find. No, for sure. So I respect everyone's position and to the naysayers, I don't try to twist their arm. I just share my experience. So my experience is, for starters, the opposite of the statement I'm making is that there is no hope, right? And I'm making the statement there is hope. So if someone wants to argue there is no hope, then they can do that. And that's what extractive agriculture does to the human soul, <laughs> right? So in the opposite, to make the statement there is hope, I base that on daily observation. I have lived and worked on three farms, which I have either owned or worked on, and started out watching each one as a very extremely degraded environment. You know, the, the last farm that I lived on back in the Midwest, it would not grow grass on grassy ground, you know, but after 90 days, there was still no grass in the summer. It was extremely depleted. And after, you know, we started getting involved with the Savory Institute and learning about rotational grazing and then that evolving into regenerative grazing, uh, it was exploding with grass out of the ground. I could run so many cows and so many pigs. And then we would find all these little, I call them Easter eggs. You know, Easter eggs are the unexpected treasures that pop up along life's journey. 
and uh, so many little Easter eggs would pop up for us. The most recent being, um, we have one field that when we got to this, our current farm, was pure Canada thistle. It was, shall we estimate, 90% Canada thistle. You could not walk through it. Which, just for people that, what is Canada thistle? It sounds like something you don't want to have. You do not. It does not help very much, relatively speaking. Better than bare ground, but it's not grass and clover, you know? Barely, yeah. So Canada thistle is an invasive weed that is very spiny. It's just covered with, they're not exactly thorns, but they're very small needles like a miniature cactus, if you will, vegetative cactus. And pigs don't enjoy walking through it. Pigs don't enjoy lying on it. You know, cows will nibble on it, but there's other things that will help them gain weight faster. And this one field was exclusively Canada thistle. It was nothing else almost, it seemed. And after a very short four rounds of pulse grazing, the Canada thistle was outcompeted by grasses, forbs, and clover. And just to have witnessed that... You know, that gives you hope, yeah. Very much so, because I can do that on landscape scales. What we did there did not take three human generations to achieve. It took four prescribed grazing events. And the ground just changed immediately underneath me. I had no idea it would happen so quickly. And we see when we're actually living in relationship with the earth, we get up eager to make observations every day. There's no shortage of those moments, you know, and that gives me an awfully lot of hope because I experience it, if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. And so why in your statement, you mentioned the humble pig into the regenerative egg movement. Hasn't it been there? And if not, why has it been ignored? Yeah. So in the regenerative agriculture movement, the low hanging fruit, and I say that respectfully, but the low hanging fruit is ruminants, animals that have a rumen and are able to live exclusively on grasses or forbs and legumes. I'll just call them grasses for simplicity for right now. So we take um, grass fed cattle or lamb. All of those creatures have the inner mechanisms, the inner machinery of their digestive system is able to break down the cell wall of grasses and extract carbohydrates from it. It's because they have a four chambered stomach. The first chamber is called the rumen and the rumen gives them their superpower. You know, their superpower is to do what I just explained and to extract carbohydrates from the cell wall. I cannot do that. I need to eat things other than the grass in my front yard <laughs> if I am to, you know, remain healthy. Survive. <laughs> yeah, if I am to survive. So cows and sheep, on the other hand, they can synthesize the amino acids that they require because of their rumen to consume pure forages and grow and be healthy and happy. The pig is more like me. The pig has a single stomach, and because of that, it was not the easiest creature to bring into the world of regenerative farming. It requires grass plus something else. So the pig does eat grass, unlike you, but needs X percent, what is it, 80? I don't know the number, but needs a lot of other things and diversity. Absolutely. The word omnivore is a gradient rather than a line in the sand. And the pig is more omnivorous. Than, Just like region egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of space to maneuver it. So the pig is more omnivorous than I am. The pig can consume grass and delights in consuming grasses and clovers. And it can get more good out of it than I can. But at the same time, if I want these animals to finish in a number of days, which is competitive with grain fed animals, because, and there's no secret, you know, we give our pigs grain and pretty much everybody does. If you were to exclusively remove grain from a pig's diet, or if you were to remove some sort of supplemental concentrate in any form, that would basically just be a mean thing to do to a pig. <laughs> So in order to get the pig to finish without it taking forever and to finish at a weight that is economically beneficial to the farmer, we do keep grain on hand. Now, on our farm, we also make use of a couple other what I kind of lovingly call unfair advantages. You know, I live a half a mile from a craft beer factory. And I receive, you know, 36... I have a feeling where this is going. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Happy pigs, happy pigs. So we receive 3,600 pounds of barley from the beer facility every week. 
and it comes in a very measured way. Every day I go get two trailer loads and then I feed it to the pigs. Because that's one of the other ways of pigs and to a certain extent chickens as well. They have the ability to take food waste at the end somewhere in the food value chain and not necessarily of our plates, but somewhere in the brewery, somewhere in the factory. And a lot of that is very edible, but not sellable. And pigs have the ability to turn it into something much more valuable as in animal protein. Yeah. So at present, the, um, the craft brewery that we picked the barley up from has to, would have to pay to have it removed from their premises. Whereas I come and get it twice a day and bring back a trailer and give it to my pigs. And, and then whatever our pigs cannot consume, if we get a denuded spot where, you know, they got extra high impact around a water tank or something, then we'll recover the ground. We'll take that barley and we'll just cover the ground with it after the pigs have moved on. I would also say that we have a relationship with a cheese house down in Portland, Maine, and we receive a 400-pound barrel of cheddar cheese every day. So between the barley and the cheddar cheese and the grass, we are meeting a lot of our pigs' needs. Now, we keep non-GMO whole grains in a bin because that's my responsibility to the pigs. If something were to happen to my supply of cheese and barley, then uh, we would need some kind of storable feed in order to keep the, gro the rate of gain headed in the right direction. And so talking about the supplements or inputs, what is then the role of the pig in your landscape, on your land, or in general in an ecosystem? Yeah. So on a farm, a pig represents a different role than in nature. The reason for that is a pig in nature, you know, uh, wild boars in California, you know, extremely destructive, or the wild boars in Texas, you know, extremely destructive. But in nature, there may be a family of wild boars, you know, on a thousand acres, let's say. So let's say that there are 15 individuals on a thousand acres. That's not exactly farming, you know, so I need to have a certain number of pigs. I'm raising pigs on pasture by the semi load. If I were to raise pigs on pasture and not manage for rooting, I would be not rotationally grazing. I would be rotationally ruining. <laughs> and every time the pigs left a paddock, it would look like a pure mud lot from World War I, no man's land kind of thing. The way that we manage for that, we manage for that in a couple of ways. The first is that we use a humane septum ring in the pig's nose, and that is applied immediately at weaning. So the pigs never actually learn to root. You know, as soon as they are weaned from nursing on their mother at about eight weeks, we apply a septum ring, a humane septum ring, and that prevents rooting. And then secondarily, we're moving the animals rotationally based on positive animal impact. So when we allow the animals back into a paddock, a temporary paddock, and of course we're, we're using uh, movable electric fencing, the same sort of fencing that the grass-fed beef world uses. We're using that, but we're just adjusting it to the height of a pig. So once the pigs have trampled and manured a paddock uniformly, then we move them on. And the combination of those two factors is that we can guarantee that the creeks that drain our farm that go directly into the Atlantic Ocean, some of these creeks used to be, you know, remnant wild Atlantic salmon runs. And we want those creeks to be as clear and cold and as full of dissolved oxygen and to have no nutrient load coming off of my farm. And because of that, we can't allow uh, commercially viable quantities of pigs that are living on our farm to root up and destroy a paddock like the wild boars in Texas do. And then how do you sell? What's the, um, uh, the one bad day, as, as some would call it, but what's the, the phase after that? If you set up Singing Pastures, which is the farm and the company you set up, what made you do that? Because you are treating pigs very differently, um, very different ecosystem function. I'm imagining you couldn't sell it all off the farm and triggered that into starting a company, starting a food brand around a very different way of farming pigs, not in-house and not a factory farm, basically, which is, I think, 99.9% .9 of all, all the pigs you will ever, pig meat you will ever eat if you're eating that. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it, the question is, why did we start a brand? And to answer that, I have a slightly long answer. It was, you know, when I grew up raising pigs, we were doing everything in the most conventional way. You know, we had our, our very own small factory farm, you know, and the pigs lived in a pig barn over on slatted floors. And this was very common in Illinois in 1980. And I realized that when I took over the farm, that I would have my freedom to be in the driver's seat and to make my own decisions. So when I eventually took over our family farm back in the Midwest, for starters, it was in a different place. So it gave me a certain blank canvas to paint on. But, you know, the first thing we did, we didn't do row crops anymore. You know, we stopped doing the high tillage row crops. We exchanged our pig genetics from indoor pigs to heritage breed outdoor pigs that can live and thrive and be happy in a wider range of temperatures and environmental conditions. And we ceased to give the animals conventional grain. We gave them non-GMO grain. We removed the antibiotics. And the last step in this enormous conversion, you know, from conventional to regenerative was that we thought, you know, like now that we're doing this additional labor, now that we're doing all of these steps to create beauty in the world, it doesn't really work to sell to the sale barn, you know, for me. So we thought, well, let's do the next step in our conversion for regenerative. Let's create, you know, a brand. A brand is a force multiplier for a variety of things. And the force multiplier that we wanted was we wanted the possibility of selling our brand, you know, when we approach retirement age. And we wanted to have a little bit of additional income that comes from the management and marketing of a brand. So at present, you know, we raise pork for my own snack stick company. It's Singing Pastures is the name of the company. And then our hero product, if you want to call it that, is called Rome Sticks, R-O-A-M. So Rome Sticks are shelf-stable, one-ounce snack sticks that we make from the pigs that we raise. And... We decided that that would be a better bet for our family in the long term to create a brand. Was that partly, I mean, I'm still understanding why the pig and not go for the, I would quote unquote, easier route of grass fed, where there is a, I wouldn't say an industry starting, but definitely a larger movement. Have you seen some signs around that, around the pig side as well, where it's, I haven't seen a lot of it around pasture raised pigs. And what have you seen in that in the last years compared to the grass fed beef space and the lamb space and then maybe the cheese even like that understanding the role of the, the animal in the ecosystem and understanding that most of pig farmed uh, is definitely not in the way we like it to be. Have you seen the same kind of, or have you seen a lot of people discovering that and maybe other farmers starting to switch as well? Or is it, is the jump enormously high to go from indoor pig farming to pasture raised and what you described just now with non-GMO, non-antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I hear two questions. The first one is, why didn't we make beef sticks? And then the second part is, how do I justify pork into the world, especially when pork is quite commonly a very destructive protein? Am I correct? Am I hearing you right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And probably a few others. It was a very long question. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. That's fine. So why not beef? That's a two-part answer for me. The first part was... The beef sticks, there's a million beef sticks in the world. We don't need another beef stick. <laughs> All the people who like grass-fed beef for a variety of reasons, high animal welfare, higher human nutrition, higher sustainability, all of those same things apply to pasture-raised pork, and nobody else was making a pasture-raised pork stick. And there's still very few in the world. You know, ours is the only nationally available pasture-raised regenerative pork stick that I'm aware of. So that's the first part. The second part was that we are thinking, you know, farmers need to be small business owners, you know, not just the romantic idea of being a farmer, but we need to be able to read our profit and loss statements and create budgets over, you know, a 12 to 36 month period. And the velocity of creating pork is so much faster than the velocity of creating beef. You know, so for example, a sow will have her first litter. On our place, we average about 10 piglets per litter, and she will have that litter on her first birthday, maybe give or take by a few weeks. You know, so that's 10 pigs created by the end of year one for that animal. Then six months later, she'll have 10 more. So that's 
20 pigs created within a 12-month farrowing cycle, starting at her first farrowing. A cow, on the other hand, you know, will probably have her first baby sometime after her second birthday, and it will be a single individual calf produced, most commonly, and then it'll be another year before she creates one more. So pigs are on a different order of magnitude in terms of business, you know, models. I can create so much more pork so much faster than I can create beef. So that's the first half of the... And then for the destruction, yeah. Yeah, for the destruction. Because that's where the destruction comes from as well. For, I mean, our love of pork or cheap pork comes probably from part of that multiplier. Yeah, it can, but it also, there's, uh, luckily for us, for people who enjoy eating pork, there is a fork in the road, you know, and the fork in the road comes from uh, just the question, you know, is it in my best interest to do this regeneratively? I guess I shouldn't argue any of it, but I will say from my experience, having grown up raising pigs in a pig barn on slatted floors, it is no fun. <laughs> and, you know, the word regenerative applies not only to farming, but it applies to the human heart. You know, it applies to our, our world. How do we feel when we wake up in the morning? And if your greatest joy is waking up and fixing ventilators in an extremely dusty, loud, smelly pig barn... If that's your pleasure, then by all means, you know, pursue it. <laughs> but that is not my greatest pleasure. You know, my greatest pleasure is watching grass grow, watching pigs eat grass, watching ecosystems heal, watching the creeks that flow through our pig pastures run clean, you know, and clear and cold, just like they did before our pigs were there. And then watching the entire thing grow and become more robust and more resilient over time. I find a tremendous amount of satisfaction in that, and we're able to do that in a profitable way. So my question to people who kind of doubt the ability of pigs to be regenerative is, um, I guess it, it boils down to a choice. You know, if someone chooses to farm pigs in the regenerative method and they find joy and profit both in that, that's a good combination, then um, I would help all of those people. I would share our knowledge. I would help other people learn how to do what we're doing to create regenerative systems that are both profitable and healing to the ecosystem. So on your land, I'm coming back to the role of pigs. Would you say the pig is the ideal one to heal that ecosystem or would ruminants, is there a role for ruminants or even chickens or is, what's the, the cocktail or the recipe needed to heal the ecosystem where you are in coastal Maine? Yeah, so I look at nature as our template. You know, farming is in one capacity a form of biomimicry. So what does nature do? Because nature has these millions and millions of years that it has developed functioning systems. And humans don't actually create systems. We look to nature and then we discover, we crack the riddle as best as we can and say, what systems are already in place? What physiological or mineral or water, you know, shed pathways are there that I need to conform to. So in nature, there are ruminants and non-ruminants. And there's got to be a reason for that diversity. You know, there's not just one kind of digestive system out there. So on my farm, we custom graze other people's cows. And those cows go ahead of the pigs. The pigs follow the cows in a leader-follower kind of relationship and so the cows are knocking down a lot of the taller forage, but they're still leaving a lot. So when the cows leave a temporary paddock, they will have only consumed between 35 and 40 percent of the available biomass. Most of that coming from the leaf tips where most of the available energy and protein is going to be found. They leave the bodies of the plants, which allow the grasses to rebound extremely quickly. At the same time, cattle, grass-fed cattle, are only pooping out grass that was already there when they came in. So they are helping... Not bringing anything. <laughs> yeah, and not necessarily, but I guess what they are doing is they are helping the earth to cycle nutrients and to hit the reset button on the grass so that more grass can be produced. So they are fulfilling an extremely important role. Now, when the pigs follow them, we're giving the pigs... A million pounds of cheese every year and a million pounds of barley every year. And then, of course, you know, we're going to be supplementing that with non-GMO whole grains. 
So let's say that 80% of what the pigs consume, they're going to poop back out. And that is a net gain for the land. So if we're managing for positive animal impact and the pigs get fed, you know, we have movable shade structures on wheels. We're constantly within a paddock. The pigs are always moving about the paddock. Let's say that they're in there for between three and five days. We move their shade structures. We move their waterers. We move where we feed them. This happens every single day. So we get this kind of rolling pin effect on the land where we are manuring, trampling, and grazing, and then moving. So even within the paddock, there's movement. And I have never seen someone regenerate and heal soil faster than with that combination. You know, the ruminants doing their part to stamp down the grass, hit the reset button, the pigs immediately following and remineralizing and fertilizing the ground. Our grazing does not happen on a grazing interval, meaning that we do it every 21 days or every 30 days. We're not doing it based on a grazing interval. We're doing it based on a recovery period. So when the grass has rebounded to become rather full in body, that's when the animals are allowed to come back in. And my understanding is, is that's going to be sequestering carbon the fastest. And then, yeah, the positive impact of the pig or the pigs is turning or taking that input of the cheese and the barley and the grain and digesting that and basically decomposing it already partly, making it available for the land too, because you're bringing quite a bit of not compost, you have, like it comes out as compost or a very available source, and especially in severely degraded land that kickstarts a lot of things. Is there an end to that as well? Like you see after a number of years, like, okay, this doesn't need pigs anymore. So we move to another piece and it, it just needs ruminants because it has rebounded and it has the diversity in grass and clovers, etc. or it is a continuous system. It'll be continuous. You know, we can build soil and just keep stacking it up to the sky, <laughs> right? Like, that's what the process of soil building is. And the more soil I can build, the more carbon I can sequester, and the more nutrient-dense food I can create. So I'll start out answering that question by saying, I could take all this cheese and barley and just get it for free and throw it on the ground, and that would probably have a invigorating effect on that soil, right? But I don't get paid to do that. I don't get paid to throw barley on the ground and go home and eat lunch, you know. What I get paid for is converting that barley and cheese and grain into something that was a lot more valuable, which is super premium pasture-raised regenerative pork. And then we go for the kind of the force multiplier effect by funneling that high-quality premium pork into our own brand, which we own. And that's how I get paid. So I get paid from converting barley and cheese and grass and clover into essentially a shelf-stable snack stick, which I sell. And that's how we restore our ecosystems. The more snack sticks and the more premium pork that we can create, the more ecosystems I can heal. And what has been the response of consumers, which I don't think have been used too much to have this kind of discussion in the non-ruminant space. What, what has been the, the education you need to do, but also general, the response of consumers to a very different pork snack? Yeah. So our pork snack is taste first, because one place where I think that the regenerative movement misses an opportunity in sales and marketing is, quite honestly, to talk over the heads of the consumers. So... We have a fantastic farming system. We can do things that cannot be done in the conventional world. And a lot of people value that. But we're going to sell our product based on the quality of the eating experience. Flavor. Yeah. Flavor. So we create the most delicious pork snack stick in the world. And I can say that because we've been selling it for several years. And one of our biggest problems is when we send samples to a grocery store, whoever gets the sample eats all of the samples and then the manager never gets a sample to make a decision and buy from. So we have to send samples more than once. This happens all the time. That People think that they're just so delicious that they make a hog of themselves and they eat the entire shipment <laughs> when it gets to the health food store. So that's, we're, we're taste first, we're flavor first. And then since, you know, the 
a lot of people today don't want anonymous food. Once they have seen this is delicious, this is nutritious, this is keto and paleo friendly, we have a lot of feathers in our hat. They can get on our website, our Instagram, our Facebook. They can get on a variety of channels. They can communicate with us directly if they want to, and they can dig as deep as they want. And if they want to know exactly how spectacularly well our pigs are healing ecosystems, we can provide them with that information. If they want to know how our pigs have an exceptional omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, they can find that information. But 90% of our sales are going to come from the product being spectacularly delicious. And then we're going to retain those sales from people digging deeper in order to find out what is this regenerative agriculture thing? Why should I care? And why is it good for me? One of the other benefits of a brand is that you don't only have to sell, or maybe at some point you get to a scale that you need more pigs to make more sticks. Have you been working and how has that been with other farmers that could supply or are supplying to you? And how has been that process of obviously sharing a recipe of how to, a recipe or a set of practices of how to raise pigs that they might have been applying some of them, not all. And how's that journey been if you have been on that road to not only sell your own your own pigs to your own to the, the stick business. Yeah. So it's another part time job. And what has allowed me to teach other farmers is just as our brand has scaled, I've been able to hire people to manage the logistics and the accounting and the Instagram. And you know what I mean? I, I can take more things off of my plate and put it in the hands of a more skillful person than myself so that I can return to my area of expertise. And it is a very deep joy for me to talk to farmers and to share our joys and sorrows together. And yeah, so over the years, we've accumulated a fairly broad base of farmers who raise pork for our brand. And one of the great things is that we can share with them how we do it. And not all of them are going to take as much pleasure as I do in watching pigs eat grass, but... Um, they can nerd out as much as they want with me. And if they don't pursue it to the 10th degree, like I do here at my place, there is a minimum requirements. You know, those minimum requirements are pasture raised, heritage breed, non-GMO and antibiotic free. And are you measuring the outcome like Bleu Blancard does in, in France? Like, are you measuring that omega-3, omega-6 ratio to see, not if they're cheating, but if they're not doing the full spectrum of what you're looking for? Yeah, so we've measured it several times and we've always been very satisfied, you know, with our results. We've done a couple of USDA funded studies on our farm where we see how much we can push grass feeding to pigs. The answer to that one was yes, we can graze pigs exclusively, but it's so much work that I don't know that I could scale it. <laughs> and it's very slow. If we have sources of barley and cheese readily on hand for free, then I don't have much incentive to create a purely grass-fed pork program. Because the barley and cheese is food waste. Like, this is not sellable. You're a pig. That's right. That's right. I am getting, I'm upcycling it. I'm getting in between the landfill and the factory, making something valuable out of it. And do you see other farmers you're working with going the same route, like looking for these upcycle opportunities to speed up, but also to upcycle food waste that would have had? potentially biogas if you're very lucky, otherwise a landfill. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know that they do that as much as I do. I think that I have a couple of really beautiful advantages that work economically because of scale and ease of handling. I think that we're probably doing that more than a lot of our other farmers. And so what's next for the business? What are the plans? We're talking summer 2021. Now, what is ahead? Yeah, what's ahead? So for the last several years, we've been bootstrapping our operation. And the beauty of that is we learn our mistakes on a small scale. We gain experience, we grow from them, and we build a very, very broad and stable foundation for having a well-managed business. Now, after doing that for several years, we are still, we're, we don't have any investors. We're entirely bootstrapped. We're debt-free and profitable. And we're ready to step on the gas pedal, you know? So in the next year, we're going to look for investors to help us to step on the gas pedal now that we're confident that we're ready for that. As we do that, we'll increase our production here on our farm. Our farm has the capacity to produce about six semi-loads of pigs a year, which would be about 900 pigs. 
and we can do all of that regeneratively. And we keep on looking for efficiencies to build into our labor because in order for our program and our methods to be scalable and to benefit the world at large over time, we need to find ways of continuing the regenerative effect while decreasing the labor component. And we think that we see ways of doing that. Do you have an example of where the labor is too much at the moment, like where you think, okay, that would be a first, because there's a lot of movement involved. You, you talk about shape mobiles and the fencing, et cetera. What's the most painful process at the moment? What's the most labor intensive one? Well, I guess for me, there isn't a negative. It's, it's working out just fine like it is, but just part of the process of relentless improvement means that we never stop looking for the next horizon. So it's working just fine as it is. And if we were to continue, you know what, we would have a little bit more permanent fencing. You know, at present, we just have a perimeter fence that circles our property and everything else within that 200 acre parcel is flexible. Is flexible. Now, if we were to put up a little bit more permanent fencing, for example, if we took 100 acres as a little driveway down the middle, and then we had on each side of it, we had permanent fencing running parallel to each other and about 100 yards apart. Then we could just move, we could basically slide temporary fencing forward and uh, just automatically be advancing. And we'd have water lines running down the side of the driveway and everything. So I think that that's our next move for next year is to put up some more permanent fencing that's essentially high tensile electric fencing. And from that, we can just use our wind-up reels of poly wire and step-in posts. And we can just, you know, do two parallel lines attached to the electrified high tensile. I may be getting off too far in the weeds and being too technical, but... No, no, it's uh, the, the, the infrastructure piece is something people forget. I mean, we had Frank Wooten of Fence on it and just talking about the cost of fencing for large-scale grazing operations... And yeah, of course, it should go holistic, et cetera. But then if you just imagine the amount of fencing you need, if you want to do that permanently, or the amount of flexible fencing and time you need for large herds, it becomes a very interesting cost, especially as there's a lot of aging or a lot of infrastructure already built for a whole different management system. So I think it's extremely relevant. And I would like to ask this question. If you had a magic wand and you could change one thing in the food and agriculture space, what would that be? could be anything. It doesn't have to be in the pig or animal protein space. It could be anything else. But what would the one thing be that you would change overnight? I would, um, there may be a couple of things, but I think one thing would be that I would encourage people to be curious. I think that sometimes we come to our answers and our conclusions too quickly without enough curiosity. And that makes uh, greenwashing possible. It also makes it so you can just put an antibiotic-free label on a pork product, you know, some generic pork product, and people will imagine all of this good stuff that goes along with it. It's, it's like the word sustainable. It, it either means everything or nothing, depending on who you talk to, you know. So for people to keep open minds and to stay curious, I think is a marvelous part of the human experience, but I think it's also very important for creating high quality thought processes that actually help us achieve our goals. Curiosity would be my desired outcome of this magic wand. And if you would be in charge of an investment fund, which has a, an interesting amount of assets under management, let's say a billion dollars, the investment horizon could be even endless, could be evergreen, but it's definitely investment amount. I'm not asking for dollar by dollar investment advice or, or investments, but what would you focus on? What would you priority be? Would you buy land? Would you invest in production facilities? Would you invest in seeds or something completely different? doesn't have to be animal protein related or pork related. But if you would be a fund manager with, let's say, an interesting amount of resources, what would you focus on for the regenerative space? It would be, it would be brand based because the brand is the customer, is where the money changes hands, you know, where the greatest quantity of money changes hands. So that's also going to be where the spotlight shines. So if we had a billion dollars, you know, to invest over time, or let's just say a large amount, it doesn't have to be a billion, a billion's an awfully lot. <laughs> but let's say that we had a large amount to... It is, but lately with the billions flying around, I have the feeling I should change this question to 10 billion because it just... Ah, okay. I don't know. Sure. It, it lost a bit of its crazy amount. That, that's why I put it there. But yeah, let's say a lot of money. Would you be buying brands, building other brands in different places? Well... 
So this is not my area of expertise, but I just, uh, I'm still curious. I, I, I follow my own advice. I'm, I'm curious if we had that amount of money, we would find a brand that is the gold standard for what they're doing, that has some traction, and that creates a large amount of authenticity. And authenticity is something that, you know, a lot of the millennials connect with. Everybody connects with authenticity. So we would probably buy something like that, and then we would expand upon the marketing, grocery, uh, web, online sales. It would grow everything. And if you have some control of the brand and you have some control of its growth and scale, then at the same time, the more you sell, the more farmers we can work with and that we can share this body of knowledge with. If you want to enjoy working with the earth and healing ecosystems and you want to do this from home, you don't want to go to town, you know, which is the majority of the farmers that I work with relate to that sentiment. They don't want to go to town. They want to stay with their families in some obscure corner of the countryside, raise their families, provide for their families and steward the earth. And I think that's what I would do or that's what I would encourage a person who wants to have a positive effect in the regenerative space is to acquire a brand, grow that brand, because the entire movement is going to be sales related, or at least is going to have a strong element of sales relationship where we as farmers or brand managers or owners, we need to compete with degenerative products. That is to say, products that harm the earth and their creation. When we replace those with regenerative products, our movement is growing and we're having a positive impact on the earth. And how important is online for you to connect directly with your end customers? It's a slice of the pie, and our pie is going to cover Amazon, online retail, online wholesale, and it's going to cover grocery. So all of those chess pieces need to be advancing in the way that makes the most sense. So for us, particularly during COVID, a lot of what we were hearing was that grocery buying was more like a, a timed speed mission. People were running in with their shopping cart, filling their shopping cart with the exact same 32 items that they get every Friday evening and taking them home as quickly as they can. There wasn't a whole lot of exploration of new products happening, is what I'm told. You know, So for us, we focused exclusively online almost for the majority of COVID. The COVID, that's where we are stacking our chips at present. We're driving towards more, whether it's online wholesale or online retail. Super important because people are still curious about exploring new brands, but they want to do it from their computer or their phone. You know, they don't want to linger for an extra 30 minutes in the grocery store reading the back of a box that they've never seen before. They, that hasn't been happening that as much in the last year as three years ago or maybe three years in the future. You know, so right now, I think the smart move for a business of my scale is advancing our online sales right now with an eye on national grocery and distribution, because, you know, getting into national grocery and distribution is definitely part of the long game. And as a final question, what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that others don't? And this definitely comes from John Kemp, who always asks this question slightly differently. So where are you contrarian? You named a few things, but if you had to name one thing where you are different from the rest of regen movement, apart from that you raise pigs, which is already a bit different. So there are two, I call them the great mysteries of regenerative. The first great mystery of regenerative is that the farmer does not directly stuff carbon into the soil we don't directly stuff, you know, omega-3s into the meat we're creating. We are creating circumstances by which the microbiome of the soil can sequester carbon. Does that make sense? Absolutely. We are not literally grabbing the carbon out of the sty and stuffing it into the ground with a pump. You know, we're simply creating the circumstances where that happens as a result of our indirect actions. And that is the part of carbon farming, grass farming, regenerative farming, you know, we want to call it profitable farming. That's the part of regenerative farming that is the first great mystery. And it's just that we are going to create the circumstances where carbon sequestration is possible. But we will not be sequestering the carbon with our own hands ourselves. That realization 
enables us to view the earth in a different way. You know, if we're viewing the earth as a partner or a companion in this journey, it's not, you know, of course, it's not just the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that makes it up. It's bigger than the sum of its parts. And viewing the earth in that way is going to help our regenerative efforts. The second great mystery of the word regenerative is that it most commonly is talked about with farming, but that it applies to all areas where there is life. You know, it's going to apply to businesses, families, relationships, friendships. The word regenerative is going to apply to those things because when a certain quantity of life-giving energy is added to any one of those systems, we're going to see that multiplier effect kick in and create possibilities which were not possible before. If in a friendship, I am actively letting my friend know that I care about them, then there's going to be a blossoming effect in that friendship. There's going to be more openness. There's going to be people extending themselves, people going the extra mile to do something good, to do what's right. And that's what regenerating a friendship looks like. And the same thing is going to apply to all areas where there's life. You know, and that's a big mystery. You know, that's the second big mystery. Once we've graduated from the first great mystery of regenerative, it's when we come to the second great mystery and realizing that the elements of disruption, rest, and regeneration apply to us, apply to our friends, apply to our families, our businesses, and our soil and our livestock. And how do you apply that to, to your business? We've had... Stuart purpose on the show to talk about steward ownership, to have that deep discussion on ownership. We had, I will link them below as well, uh, Marcus of New Foundation Farms talking about regenerative businesses. How are you applying that in Singing Pastures, the regenerative business approach? And so we're a savory hub and we're the savory hub for the state of Maine. And one of the big words that is used in the savory institute is the word context. Context basically means what is your reason for doing something? And I think one step further, and I apply the word context, is how do you want to feel when you wake up in the morning? How do you want to feel when you go to do your work, your work, your vocation, your reason for being on earth? How do you want to feel as you go about that? I think that that's really important because the regenerative movement is basically founded on the ideas of disruption, rest, and regeneration. It's the same thing that weightlifters or athletes are going to do a heavy workout followed by rest, followed by their muscles and lungs and hearts gaining strength. You know, so many small business owners and farmers have an extremely good work ethic, but I think that they would benefit from having a regenerative work ethic, which means that you cannot have disruption followed by disruption followed by disruption followed by disruption and then expect to grow. You know, so many studies show that people who work extremely long hours have extremely reduced creativity. And small business owners and farmers, that's going to be not only determination and work ethic, but creativity, getting past the limitations of our own mind and our own circumstances is going to be what accelerates our, the growth of our business. So with that in mind, we have to have a discipline of disruption is good, time of high challenge where our hearts, our souls, our minds, our bodies, our farms, our businesses are stretched. And people call that growing pains, right? So we experience our growing pains, but it is mandatory for the quickest growth of a company. And I'm not just talking about comfortable growth. I'm saying that if you have disruption followed by disruption followed by more disruption, you will not have the creativity to, to achieve goals and make use of opportunities that come your way or create opportunities that come your way. So anyway, that's where I'm going with that is farmers need to not just have a good work ethic, but they have to understand this is how the human psyche functions. And it functions in the same way that our soil, nature, pastures, soil, grass, cattle, pigs, you know, there's an enormous universal truth that's hidden in this riddle. And when you crack the riddle, you have more fun. I want to thank you so much, John, for this interview, which was definitely fun and very interesting. And I learned a lot and wish you good luck with the growth and the rest, because otherwise nothing happens and you won't be created. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, you have a wonderful day. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. 
That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.